All right, I'll do that. Bingo. Okay. Everybody can see the words in pathology round? Yes. yes. Okay. I think we're good. <laughs> um, and I'm going to make sure that this is presentation mode. Oh, okay, that's fine. Um, so the very first piece, uh, we put out three panels. Um, and so if somebody from OSU, i.e. Becca, wants to start, because Becca is the one that's here right now, um, and um, George, you have downloaded the Dropbox images, yes. the images from Dropbox. Um, if you could pull up the first case, and we'll see if Becca can um, um, do a basic description, and Becca, I'm just going to hand you my phone. Well, um, if that if that's the case, then you, I'm, I'm, we're going to have to have we'll have to have me be the presenter back. That's fine. All right. I think this is. Uh, you should be able to see the H and E uh, panel for the first case. Case. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. All right. Uh, Whoever is talking about it, if you want, you just tell me to move to whichever panel, and I'll uh, get us there. And uh, if you want, uh, I can make give you mouse, uh, mouse and keyboard control, or I can just f follow along. And oh, I know what we we forgot to do last time is make a good um, uh, thing for how. Uh, is this an easier thing to see for pointing to things than the little uh, hand or arrow? That works. Because the other one is to do it this way. That's a hand. Let's see. Ah, this is maybe even better. Is that too small? Can you see? That's All right. I think the red, the red is probably The red better. is the best? All right. We'll do that. Okay. So I'll leave it over here for the time being. Fire away. All right. Um, well, this is uh, Becca Conkin. I'm the first year resident at Ohio State. And I'm the only one here. So I'm doing, <laughs> I'm doing this first <laughs> panel. I'm the only anatomic here. So um, looking at this glomerulus, I think that the mesangium is multifocally expanded. And I think that there's too many mesangial cells or, or proliferation of mesangial cells multifocally throughout the glomerular tuft. Um, I think there's some hypertrophy of parietal um, cells in Bowman's capsule, and there might be some uh, sneakiation, although it's kind of hard to tell, um, yeah, on h &E. And that was pretty much it for the h &E. So we can go to... All right. Uh, yeah. da -dum, da -dum, let's see. Hmm, I see what happens. Oh, get, give me just a moment to... Uh, uh, da -da 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 -da. I have to switch back and forth. Did you, you want to do the sure. PAS next? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I didn't have too much to add, though. Um, uh, well, but but you're you're correct. It, it, and one, and another piece of this is that it's a little easier to appreciate um, the where the this is a and this and this uh, are mm -hmm. uh, are and to a certain extent here are it's a at least for me, easier to appreciate that these are truly areas of mesangial expansion with increased mesangial okay. cellularity. Hmm? Okay. Sure. All right. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, you were right the, the first time. I, I just think that the anatomic sort of 
categorization of what we're looking at is a little more distinct in that regard. And let's go then to the uh, silver stain or method. It's not truly a stain, Rachel keeps telling me. All right. Uh, and uh, we'll get back to that. Sure. So on the silver, I thought that I could make out some uh, spikes. I don't remember what the more specific term for them is. That's what we call them. And, uh, Perfect. You, well, all right. There. This is a capillary loop. We'll exhibit that. And this one here would be. What do you think about just the general um, uh, thickness of the uh, GBM on the silver stain here? I wasn't overly impressed by the, the thickness of the basement membrane. It might be multifocally thickened, but I had a little bit of trouble with that. Mm. Well, uh, let's see here. I would suggest to you that uh, this one, this one, this one, uh, and, and uh, especially out here for being so peripheral, they're, they're a bit too thick. Okay. Okay. Thick. okay? okay. All right. Yep, I'm with you. And this is the trichrome? Trichrome. Mm hmm one, let's go back to the Jones here just for a minute. This is uh, one of the ones where it, you, you can often see more clearly the Senechia. And, and I think this is just touching as opposed to, but here, you know, the, there's really not a direct uh, connective tissue link between the, you know, matrix of the capillary walls and them matrix of the Bowman's capsule so that this one isn't actually uh -huh. illustrating them and sometimes go into this um, uh, stain is the w way to sort of figure out whether they're actually um, uh, connected as opposed to just uh, being uh, up against one another and it's and okay it's and, and the trichrome can help with that as well so. uh, absolutely there you go okay okay all right, and off to the EM. Uh, let's see, that's a little too big. Let's see here. Are you are you good with uh, ultrastructure? Uh, we'll see, I suppose. All um, right, so fire we're up. Looking, we're looking, <laughs> we're, the center of the screen is a capillary lumen. We have two endothelial cells, and you can appreciate the basement membrane, which is kind of irregularly thickened, and then subjacent to that are kind of whorls or um, granular deposits of a more electron-dense material that's kind of swirling. Right here, here, so, here. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, so that's what I was interpreting as the, the lesion of interest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think of uh, another piece of it? it there, there's actually, um, I mean, and, and get, getting focused on the, the basement membrane, finding the basement yeah. membrane in an EM is always sort of the first step, getting oriented. Yeah. So capillary lumen, red blood cell, endothelial yeah. cells, uh, uh, epithelial cells out here. Um, the, there, there's a little bit of discernible foot process, uh, but mostly they're uh, effaced here okay. and here and here. And out here, this is villus transformation, is it not? Okay. And off screen okay. is probably some of that um, uh, podocyte or visceral epithelial cell hypertrophy that you were commenting about before. All right. Okay. And the base, and the the other thing is that you're correct about the irregularity of the thickness, but the irregularity is mostly on the uh, sub epithelial or abluminal surface and is attributable right. to response of the GBM matrix production by the cells in, in the field uh, to, and, and, and in this instance, for instance, surrounding the uh, electron-dense deposit and here as okay. well. Okay? So it, it's pretty much the, 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 you get the idea that the deposits are being laid down on the outside and then are being responded mm -hmm. to and encompassed by the um, remodeled GBM. Okay. okay. We good there? Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, did I tell any lies, Rachel? Nope. All right. So, uh, well, I, you know, Rachel's the expert. I just uh, work here. All right. So um, we have, uh, she selected two of the um, immunostains, and I'll make them a little bigger so we look at them one at a time. Oops, there we go. You get them too big, they pixelate, so. All right, so this is lambda light change, which is sort of, goes along with IgG and, uh, and to a certain extent IgM and things, so it just stains brighter. Okay. Um, yeah, I have trouble reading IF, but I thought this was, I called it just positive. I think that the yeah. staining is highlighting the glomerular I touched pretty specifically. Yeah. And that's true, but importantly, the, the, you get, it's not just, you know, green. It, 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 you get a sense of granularity, and okay. it is the capital. This, this one maybe is a one to you get a sense of. And, and again, the, the IF is always hard to photograph well. I mean, it, the one, it's harder to yeah. cut them thin and get them all, all in the focal plane, and et cetera. And, and sometimes it's a bit like tar taking a picture of the dark side of the moon if, if, if it's low intensity. Mm -hmm. but, but this is a capillary loop that, that gives you a sense of distinct granular deposits in the capillary wall. You get that sense okay. with this one as well, okay? And, uh, okay. and then if you have that idea in your head, the, oh, the, these are almost confluent and you wonder whether it's the picture or, you know, exactly how it's stained there. But you get a sense of, uh, of granular fluorescence, uh, which is consistent with the deposits we just saw. And then in places you wonder about, it, you know, extending into the mesangium, but... Uh, 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 but th this one is not a very, uh, um, for instance, here you, you might say, well, there's mesangial staining as well in that area. Okay? Okay, so we're going to kind of go to the diagnosis about this because we have a lot of cases. Yep, all right. Cases. Okay. I'm, I'll, so I'll both get the lambda and C3 have the same type of staining process. Um, and um, Becca, the best diagnosis that you could come up with was, yeah, so it's an immune complex mediated, and, and we often talk about different patterns of immune complex deposition, and this one had sub-epithelial electron dense deposit, and was really um, very minimally hypercellular. There was some hypercellularity, but it was mild, um, and so that gives it um, a, a membranous pattern. Um, and George, if you make me my, if you make me the presenter now, we can. I have a little bit of a PowerPoint about this. Um, I also specifically asked for two possible clinical findings, um, and um, these are kind of good follow-up um, questions, um, especially for board's exam situation. And everybody can see what I'm saying, um, right? I can. Yes. Um, okay. So, um, uh, and so, and for these, anything that would be seen in the nephrotic syndrome would be an acceptable answer. Anything that would be proteinuria, um, ascites, hypoalbuminemia, um, and and the key factor is not not discussing the presence of azotemia because these dogs um, really have very minimal um, tubular interstitial disease. Um, and that would be something you would um, expect to examine the tubular interstitial compartment. We obviously just showed you photographs of the glomeruli, um, but the glomerulus is still patent and the capillary loops are still open. So azotemia is usually not seen, um, especially in these um, kind of cases where it's just glomerular lesion and no tubular interstitial disease. So um, and this dog the picked up pattern. Hello? Sorry, I said this dog. Sorry, I just said that this dog fit that with um, a serum creatinine of 0.8, but an albumin yeah. uh, and so that was I have low a, and a little bit, Yeah, and I have, I have some um, different um, this, uh, things, and all of this will be sent to you guys. You guys can download it from Dropbox as well. But this was my um, description with the bold kind of um, text being probably the most important. I often talk about um, looking at histology, looking at the portocyte hypertrophy, um, and with studying with the MDs, they often look at how those nuclei are oriented. 
Um, and if they're really oriented towards the urinary space with those nuclei almost, you know, jumping, it looks like the photocytes are jumping ship is how they used to joke about it. Because um, the photocytes are really uncomfortable with the fact that there are electron dense deposits beneath them. And I know that's anthropomorphizing, but it kind of helps everybody remember what's going on. So if you see prominent photocyte hypertrophy and nuclei oriented to the urinary space, that should kind of give you a hint on histology. The spike-like projections are really important, and that gives us a really good um, sense that there is something, again, on the glomerular capillary wall that's stimulating production of new glomerular base of membrane. Um, so those are key features. In this particular case, you really couldn't appreciate the um, immune complexes on the trichrome stain, although some cases they're quite prominent and we can see them on the trichrome stain. It just wasn't present on this particular case. Um, then I can, the EM and IF, again, Becca hit most of the, the important points. Um, and um, I think on EM, you talk about electron-dense deposits, but you can interpret them as immune complexes based on their characteristics. There was one um, deposit that was undergoing the solution, and it was kind of the electron-lucent area, um, which kind of suggests that there's been a little bit of chronicity because there is some kind of dissolution of the deposit. Um, and then IF uh, is perfect about, you know, noting what stains we stain with. And then the granular is a really key word when we talk about positivity for immunofluorescence. So um, if it's just, uh, you know, bright staining or splotchy staining or blush staining or whatever, the granularity is, is actually indicative of immune complex disease, whereas all the other patterns can be somewhat nonspecific. Um, and can be actually artifacts. So splotchy staining can be artifact and it can be nonspecific. So granularity is what you really want to look for. Um, membranes, Rachel, anything? Quick yeah. question, Rachel. Uh, on EM, I also was wondering about microvillus transformation. Would you call that? Um, yeah, we see that a lot. I think um, I, um, I didn't put it in my description. We just hit on so many things where photocytes are, inter um, are, are injured. Um, but that would be another thing that uh, if, it's definitely there, and it's prominent in this case. Um, so everybody um, saw the little kind of cytoplasmic projections on the EM picture um, coming off the photocyte. Um, and we just we see that a lot in photocyte injury, and it could be uh, it's a very nonspecific change. Um, so uh, this is uh, you know for everybody to kind of read um, afterwards. Um, but so the take-home points is that membranous glomerulonephropathy used to be, in veterinary pathology, a thickened glomerular base membrane. But now that we have a good biopsy, you know, a, a, a biopsy service, oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm actually slowed down, sorry, I apologize. So um, thank you for picking up, because I do talk very quickly. <laughs> um, so uh, membranes used to be a disease where histologically there was a thickened glomerular base membrane. Um, and now we have modified that, and it's specifically a disease that has to have immune complexes. And almost always, they're located in a, a position between the glomerular base membrane and the protocyte, like we saw in this case. Um, the fact that they are on the outside of the capillary loop, they're away from the capillary lumen, it means that if they activate the complement system, they're not going to attract inflammatory cells. And that's kind of the basic difference between membranous and what we'll see later with membranoproliferative. So when they're on the outside of the capillary loop, there is very little chemotaxis or attraction of inflammatory cells because they're just they're not in a location that can induce that that response. Um, so um, if you aren't able to do EM or you're not able to do immunofluorescence, you should at least be able to see evidence of remodeling, which is what we saw on these silver stains, those spikes, um, those spike-like projections. Um, and so that would give you confidence that it's going to be a membranous glomerulonephropathy. If you have a smooth outer contour, then it's not likely to be membranous glomerulonephropathy. So just having a thick basement membrane no longer meets the cutoff for the diagnosis. It has to have remodeling. Um, I, if I'm unsure um, and I have just light microscopy, I simply call it a glomerulopathy characterized 
by glomerular phase and membrane thickening. Um, I don't I don't go through with membranes because to me that is an immune complex mediated disease. As Becca pointed out in her description, there is some mild mesangial hypercellularity in this particular case. We often see that in this disease that still is okay in membranous. Remember, I think I told you last month that the mesangial cells will proliferate with very little stimulation. They just like to proliferate. That's what they do. So, um, so just having mesangial hypercellularity um, is okay. It still can be something that happens with membranous disease. Um, and then I put in italics that it's our impression. Um, and that's just based on what George and I see um, and Mary and I see at the Veterinary Renal Pathology Service that if you have a membranous diagnosis and you have very little tubular interstitial scarring, um, you probably have a reasonably good prognosis um, because we can, especially if you treat with immunosuppressive therapy, um, again, it's because there's, there's really no scarring yet in the specimen. So, so it's our, it is our impression at our service that it seems to have a pretty good prognosis. And that's the impression in humans as well. Um, and then the two last points, um, or last three points, are kind of how membranous in, in humans, it actually gets um, subdivided into two separate categories, either secondary or primary slash idiopathic. Um, we think in, in veterinary species, we often see the secondary phenomenon. Um, but again, we haven't really looked for the protein that is involved in primary membranous, which is the phospholipase A2 receptor. Um, and so because it hasn't been investigated in dogs, it's probably beyond what the scope of what you need to know for boards. Nobody knows it in veterinary species. Um, and then just keep in mind that this process could possibly recur in humans, and we think sometimes it might be able to recur in dogs as well. Any questions about membranous and pathogenesis or diagnostic criteria? I, and I know I speak quickly, so please um, ask questions. Um, either type them out, and they should pop up on the side of my screen. I think we're Anyone? good. I think we're good. Okay. Um, okay, so we can go to the next case, George which is um, a little difficult, not as difficult, it's just it's um, maybe not something that everybody has seen because um, it wasn't in the original paper I sent. Are there volunteers in the outside world that I can, so I can put this thing on mic and speakers and um, anybody from maybe Texas A&M, I know you guys were going to uh, volunteer last month. Anyone? I think the TAMU folks may not have a microphone. Oh, okay. All right. Um, I see. Um, Why not? Uh, do you you want me to just uh, oops? Uh, give you um, mouse and keyboard control and let you just drive here. Okay. Um. Okay, since this is a little bit more of a um, a uh, case that wasn't really presented in the original paper, I'm happy to do this one because I don't want to scare anybody away. Um, and again, um, the, the stains actually kind of show, the sim uh, show similar features for all the stains, um, namely that we have some um, hypercellularity within the mesangial compartment. Um, up here we have probably about 20 nuclei within one segment. So it is segmental mesangial hypercellularity. That is present in the um, TAS as well, which um, we can... I'm going there. So the question here was how, how do I know that it's mesangial cells, and I think the PAS helps you. So the PAS yes. really delineates where the mesangial matrix is, um, and you can see that um, there is... Um, I think I've got, yeah, now I have the pointer. So we have too many cells here within the mesangial zone, whereas your actual capillary lumens are completely open. So that's how we know it's mesangial hypercellularity as opposed to the other term being endocapillary hypercellularity. So mesangial hypercellularity we're confident about, 
we do have some hypertrophy um, and almost like foaminess of the podocyte cytoplasm. Again, podocytes often get um, uh, activated and reactive for many reasons. So both the mesangial cells and the podocyte um, uh, prominence um, are somewhat nonspecific. In addition to the mesangial hypercellularity, you have too much mesangial matrix. The fact that I can fit you know, three of these dots in there is, is too much mesangial matrix. It should be very fine, delicate, and lacy. Um, it's hard to really evaluate the glomerular basement membrane. Um, sometimes it looks in normal thickness. Sometimes it looks a little mildly thickened. Um, and if we go to the silver stain, George. Yep. I, I have to switch back and forth uh, with the yeah, um, things in order to do this. And, and again, folks, the, the silver stain and the PAS are the ones that allow you to separate the different compartments within the glomerulus and begin to figure out where the changes are, mesangial, endocapillary, and, and that sort of thing. Do not the, the fact that we look at it in the H&E and begin to spout off about where things are is, is sort of uh, reading between the lines as opposed to actually being able to, to see it clearly. And Rachel, would you mind just helping to delineate how you would know that that's just nature's expansion versus sclerosis? Oh, okay. And this was so the question, I guess, for everybody to hear, um, difference between mesangial expansion versus glomerular sclerosis or segmental glomerular sclerosis. So sclerosis requires actual effacement of the peripheral capillary loop, um, and whereas mesangial expansion is just, um, it's just obviously expansion of those zones, but the capillary loops themselves have not been effaced by extracellular matrix. Um, so, so once the capillary so, so, loop so this, for instance, out here, th this whole, this is, th the change is just in the mesangium. It has not... Um, solidify this entire lobule or this one right. or th th that's the point I think right yeah um, and so okay so the silver stain um, again it is a little um, uh, there, there is some variability about thickness of the glomerular base membrane um, in most areas the basement membrane has um, a smooth outer contour there are some hints of some irregularities um, on some capillary loops, but in most capillary loops, it's a smooth outer contour. Um, and I think the trichrome is, is very much similar to what we were looking at before. Um, yeah, it is. There are some areas. So the question here at OSU is, is are they thick? And again, there are some capillary loops that appear thickened or that, that are mildly thickened, and then there are other capillary loops um, like this one is of normal thickness. So it is irregularly thickened. But again, having a smooth outer contour is important. Um, and we see the same thing on the trichrome stain as well. Um, oh, is there a question at the 9 o'clock position? Um, and you're asking about on the silver stain or on the trichrome and silver. So, um, and I think we kind of highlighted, or we talked about it um, uh, earlier, the silver stain is probably the, a really good way to assess for um, synechia. Um, here we have the vascular pole. Um, and so whether or not this is just sitting very closely, um, I often, if it's, if it's this equivocal, um, so uh, sorry, and I realize that the, um, question was sent to me, and maybe not everybody can see it, but the question is, is this, is this right here a synechia? Um, and um, if it's this equivocal, um, Jeremy, I usually like to see some kind of reaction around the outside, so I like to see multi-lamination of the glomerular, or sorry, of, of Bowman's capsule basement membrane, or maybe a little bit of fibrosis right out here. So, um, you know, if it just looks like it's one tiny little pinpoint area that's touching, I probably would ignore it. That's not to say that there's probably synechia elsewhere in, in this specimen. So, you, you, actually um, might, you might actually be more fretful about this particular spot here than out here. But, but, but again, right. it, 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 
you you will want to see it and uh, with more evidence that it really matters than to just because it's opposed. Yeah. Right. Um, okay, so we can do the um, EM right now, George. I guess. Okay, so again, we have a single capillary loop. We have the endothelial cell nucleus at the base of the capillary loop, kind of resting on the mesangium, and that's exactly where it should. You be. can drive now. Uh, and the capillary itself has, um, or, or sorry, extending from the mesangium out into um, the actual wall of the capillary loop are um, variably electron dense deposits. Um, they're quite large, and they are going in between the um, endothelial cell cytoplasm here and glomerular basement membrane here. So they are um, quite prominent in the mesangial zones, and then they have a continuous extension out into the capillary wall. Here, everybody can see the foot process of basement. Everybody can see these little cytoplasmic projections, which is the microvillus transformation, again, a, semi, a somewhat non-specific change, um, and then um, the um, the endothelial cell cytoplasm really isn't reacting, um, or it, it, it's fairly normal, and the and the endothelial cell nucleus is in a normal location. Um, so, uh, if we go to the immunofluorescence, we can verify that that electron dense material are in fact immune complexes, um, and uh, that's because they are staying positive with lambda light chain. Um, and if we kind of, um, and I think if you guys go back um, and compare what we see on the lambda light chain and the C3 for this case versus the previous case, these are a lot chunkier. <laughs> um, there is a little bit of granularity out here, but these are a lot chunkier. And, and we're also, um, and this just takes experience, but this is highlighting the zandial zones. Um, whereas a lot of the capillary loops that are out here are not staining. So um, what we saw in the EM being very mesangial based and kind of going out to the neck of the capillary loop is being reflected in our immunofluorescence. Um, and so the, the diagnosis for this case is actually mesangial proliferative glomerulonephritis. Um, and the C3 mirrors that as well. Maybe a little bit more capillary loop staining on the C3 than on the lambda light chain, but they're both there. And so now, if I am the presenter, George, I'm, back. I'm getting you. I'm no, I know that's working fine. on it. <laughs> oh, and I actually, so I did forget to um, uh, to do my next slide for membranes, but you guys will actually that you will have the um, uh, actual history for this is the history for the case with membranes, um, so that you'll have a little more clinical data for that particular case. But like we said, that this patient was not azopemic, and that was the membranous case. So for the next um, uh, slide, if I can get it to go. Um, case two, I did the description. I gave the diagnosis. Again, you'll have all of the um, description that I um, uh, assumed was or predicted to be the most important point. Um, and it is a mesandria proliferative glomerulonephropathy, also called mesandria proliferative glomerulonephritis. Um, and the reason I put question marks is because it's a fairly uh, uh, not really well understood disease in, in animals. It is actually one of the most common, um, not cause, I guess I shouldn't say cause of proteinuria, I guess I should say one of the most common glomerulonephritis is in humans. Um, so I will change that before you guys all have access to this PowerPoint. But it is one of the most common diagnoses we get from humans with uh, renal biopsy. Um, and that's because humans have a very high proportion of um, an IgA, glomerulonephritis. Um, and it is um, restricted or, or very, it's found predominantly in the Asian population. Um, and the reason we probably don't see it as commonly in animals is that non-primates, as in everything else that's not a primate, <laughs> doesn't seem to make that same IgA isoform. So IgA type 1 is the isoform that is involved in the Xander proliferative glomerulonephritis. And because the anything that's not a primate can't make IgA type 1, we probably just don't see the disease the way we see it in humans. And we actually have seen it in some marmosets as well. Um, 
so um, that being said, this case had um, IgG positive staining. I didn't show you that picture, but there is IgG positive staining in this case. Um, and so uh, IgG dominant major proliferative disease um, can happen in humans, and that's probably what we see in, in small animals as well. Um, so again, it seems to be fairly rare, but the reason I wanted to show it to you is because it is a fairly classic um, lesion. So it's one of those, you know, rare but kind of pathognomonic. You're going to see mesangial cell proliferation. You're going to see mesangial expansion. And you're going to see the EM where those, those complexes are starting out in the mesangium and they might be kind of infiltrating the capillary loop, but it's very prominent in the mesangial zone. Um, and then again, the italics being that we get the clinical impression on our service. And again, we don't see this very often, but we do get the impression that the, it actually probably progresses to a sclerosing phenotype where you will start to have segmental sclerosis. Um, and so if you didn't have immunofluorescence and you didn't have EM and all you're looking at like mycoscopy, you could confuse this with a sclerosing a, a focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, which is one of the cases we looked at last month. So that kind of highlights the need for EM and immunofluorescence to kind of verify that there are actually deposits in there that's mediating this process. Um, and this particular case um, was a greyhound, an Italian greyhound. She was partner, 3PC was 16.2, and it was identified, um, she wasn't clinical for it, but it was identified because they were doing an anesthetic workup because they were going to remove multiple mast cell tumors. Um, she was not azotemic. She had a normal serum cholesterol and a normal, uh, and she was not hypertensive. And when they did the anesthesia for the mast cell tumor re removals, they went ahead and got some biopsies at the same time, and this is what we found. Again, not very common um, in our service, but the, the histopathology and the electron microscopy and the immunofluorescence were classic, and that's kind of when I want to show it to everybody, okay? Um, any questions about mesangio proliferative disease? Anyone? Could there be, um, you know, any type of circulating immune system? Like so, and so that question here is, is pathogenesis. Is this a similar pathogenesis? Um, you know, or do you have a circulating um, immune complex? Um, do you have circulating immune complexes? Um, and we actually don't know. Um, we do know. So I, I can only speak to what we know in humans, and that's because they make an they make uh, a poorly glycosylated IgA. So then they start to bind antibodies to their IgA. We don't have any clue in dogs. <laughs> so uh, whether or not these are circulating immune complexes that then just get, you know, pushed into the mesangium, or whether you're actually making antibodies against mesangial proteins, it's, it's really hard to say. I, I do think these are often kind of a chunky deposit as opposed to really good granularity. Um, so, again, we just don't have enough data right now to know what happens or how this, the pathogenesis in dogs. We have a, a very small set of these cases, period, in dogs, and, and nobody has uh, gotten beyond just recognizing that they exist in terms of figuring out uh, issues about uh, pathogenesis or uh, implications for pathogenesis. Okay. Um. So we have one last panel, which I think uh, is pretty, again, straightforward. So we could do the panel. And again, actually, nobody has microphones, so everybody's basically calling in on a phone. Is that correct? Um, Does somebody want to pick the phone? And I'm not sure we have anyone who, but the volunteers, these step forward pro, uh, right away or let Ra Rachel go. We'll, we'll leave it up to you. I would prefer if somebody would step forward because this is. Uh, Rachel, I'm here, but I spoke okay. last month. <laughs> hey, Shannon, will help. Okay, so we're. <laughs> Fire away. Okay, I, okay. Who, who again, needs a pointer? Just... Is it Shannon? Uh, yeah, but you know what, George? I'm fine with just saying, uh, you know, using the clock or you can point for me. So okay. I don't know. All right. Uh, uh, um, and again, I apologize. I didn't prep beforehand, so. Um, we'll forgive you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we're looking at a uh, single glomerulus, and I think um, the prominent feature here is the uh, marked proliferation of mesangial cells. 
And other than that, on, on this H&E, I think that's probably about it. You can basically see that the, uh, diffusely the glomerulus is affected by numerous, numerous cells. I'd point out two things further. One is the sense of lobulation here. Okay, yeah. Okay. All mean. right, that's, that, that's uh, something that uh, shows up in this disease. And the other thing, although we'll see it more with other, is, is that the cellularity, which is greatly mesangial, there's also a paucity of patent capillary lumens in these. All right? Yep. Okay. Great, thank you. Here's the PAS. Okay, so I think that kind of this, the same features here. I think that the capillary loops are a little bit more evident in the stain, as you said. And then as far as um, thickness of the GBM, uh, I would say peripherally, like at 3 o'clock, they look okay. But I would say in other regions, um, multifocally, like at 6 o'clock, I think that there is thickening of the GBM potentially in some areas, but otherwise they look all right. So the silver, um, again, peripherally at like 3 o'clock, they look okay, um, but internally I'm almost seeing some, I don't know if there's some double contours or some... Um, Might be a little bit right here. Yeah, okay. yeah and then kind of down from where your arrow was just at. It almost looks like there's a little bit of loopholes, kind of right at the center, but yeah. Well, uh, yeah, but that, that's sort of out in, in mesangular. To, you'll okay. you'll want to look for double contours out in the peripheral capillary loops. But another point here is that now one can begin to have a sense of, uh, of cellularity within the lumens of capillaries. So this is not just that, that you get more of a sense of, endocapillary hypercellularity because now you can tell where the basement membranes are, where the lumens are in a, in a much better sort of appreciation of, uh, of anatomical uh, separation of different compartments within the glomerulus with, with this stain versus even this one and certainly with regard to this one. So it, this is a, is a stain where it, although they're not all obliterated by the cellularity, a great uh, amount of the hypercellularity is actually within the lumen of the capillaries. All right? Okay, great. So for the trichrome, it's kind of the same, same deal. You have the um, hypercellularity. You're still able to see um, some of the capillary loops. Um, yeah, more of the same. Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, so for the EM, uh, obviously in, directly in the center is going to be uh, the capillary lumen. And then you can, on the periphery, you can see the, the GBM. Yep. And at the, yeah, at that area right there, okay. George, I'm... Right. Is those um, electron dense, is that just part of the endothelium? Because it kind of seems like it's not really incorporated into the GBM. Well, the, 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 the point of this <laughs> is okay. that there are, at number yeah. one, electron dense deposits in the capillary wall. All right? And in contrast okay. to the first one we looked at, they are all located in the, on the luminal side of yeah. the uh, G, of the original GBM rather than uh, on the abluminal side. Okay. Yeah, and then there's foot process effacement. There's foot it. process effacement and a variety of things. Although the, the you know the microvillus transformation, at least in this field, is not as prominent. There's a little couple of them. But the key point yes. now now here it, you can actually I mean, if it was truly you know pure subendothelial what would be over the basement membrane would be nothing except endothelial cytoplasm but we have a little you know th this is uh, some reactive change and whatnot now that there's an endothelial cell out here pretty much out in the periphery and we, and we, or maybe even a mesangial cell you can't tell them apart by em per se but the, there there is some cellular interpositioning in the capillary wall and, and whatnot and, and 
But this is about as close to a pure subendothelial deposit. Now they're all in, in the place where they need to be for, again, Rachel made the point before, when, when the immune deposits are on this side, the, the immune amplification system with, with, it turns on all the complement and, uh, and, and recruitment of inflammatory cells and cytokines and everything that make su such an endocapillary uh, cellular reactivity and, and recruit um, inflammatory cells. All that's happening because these are on a side where the, the bloodstream is bringing all those materials for inflammation to it. And, and so, and, yep. all right. And so, so we have, um, you're right, we have electron dense deposits. And we, I think even here, um, Oops. right below that endothelial cell nucleus, there's some new base of membrane formation. So, the, so right. remember the endothelial cell and the podocyte synthesize the glomerular base of membrane. So the presence of deposits stimulates new synthesis of new glomerular base of membrane by that endothelial cell. So that gives us our double contours when we are looking on histopathology. It's the fact that the endothelial cell is synthesizing new glomerular base membrane between to, to separate itself from those underlying immune complexes. And again, the immunofluorescence verifies that the electron dense deposits we saw um, are in fact um, are in fact immune immune complexes again with the lambda light chain and the C3. And the, in the interest of time, we're going to head to the PowerPoint, George. All right. What, um, one, the, the other, uh, okay. Yeah, I'm, get, I I'm getting, well, there's some nuclear debris and things there that would might, mm -hmm. we, we would, we would focus on some other day. Uh, so... Um, great job, Shannon. Thank you for stepping up. And again, next time when we do this, everyone will have our um, okay. You're our, good. Uh, microphones, and we will have our own microphone. I promise, because we ordered one um, for this particular room. We were just trying to use a broken one today. So uh, this is from a dog. Again, we gave the description. Very hypercellular. We have immune complexes, and they're in a sub endothelial location. So, Shannon, your diagnosis was? Black. Um, <laughs> uh, I would have said, no, I'm here. Um, I muted you for a second. Um, so, would this be, uh, I'm sorry, I just had a brain fart. Um, MPGN. Yes. Yeah. I'm proliferative. I'm proliferative. Um, so, the, the, proliferation because of the hypercellularity and then the membrano because of the glomerular base of the brain is remodeled. Um, we see this, um, and I asked for a possible underlying systemic disease, so anything um, often like we often can associate with Lyme disease, Leishmania, um, it's been associated in the literature with diarphalaria, um, and that's my description. Those are my EM and immunofluorescence descriptions, which again will be available. I even gave it points because I use this as an exam question, as a mock exam question one. Um, and um, this is the same disease, just for all of you guys that are trying to think about other ways we call this. It's also called mesangiocapillary glomerulonephritis. Um, that's kind of an archaic name. We don't use it anymore. But if you see, if you come across that in the literature, it's, it's talking about membranoproliferative. Um, and again, a lot of diseases that we have associated with it. Um, it's been um, most of these are at least in the literature. Actually, these top four in the literature, um, and the top and the bottom three are ones that that we've identified or at least um, have seen um, cases of. In the immuno or in the um, vegetative renal pathology service, um, and again, um, diagnostic criteria requires subendothelial, and then the intramembranous um, immune complexes can be either just hanging out in the lamina densa, or sometimes we actually call them intramembranous because that subend or sorry because the endothelial cells are making new glomerular base membrane. So after ages and ages of remodeling, they actually seem to be in the membrane itself. So it's just because of that kind of chronic um, remodeling process. Um, so, but again, we, we assume that even the, um, even the ones that have double contours 
um, at some point we're in a subendothelial location. And then again, you have to have hypercellularity. Um, the case we saw today had, you know, pretty good evidence of endocapillary hypercellularity. Sometimes um, if it's chronic, um, we might only see mesangial hypercellularity. Um, so it, it honestly depends on the time point at which you do the biopsy. If you don't have EM or immunofluorescence, you would at least need to demonstrate the double contours, um, hopefully with the silver stain. You might be able to see it on a PAS stain, but that, that, that's what you need um, in order to diagnose it um, on histopath alone. Um, and if you don't have that evidence, then again, you know, play it safe and say glomerulopathy characterized by, you know, hypercellularity and irregular GVM. So I would rather people play it safe than to overdiagnose this disease. Um, and, then, and then I kind of make a comment, and I, I want to spend the last two minutes about this concept of a pattern versus a disease. Um, nephropathology is probably taking the same route that dermatopathology has done in the past, where we talk about patterns of disease. So, um, and, and usually that's a histologic pattern. So having hypercellularity, having some thickened glomerular basement membranes can actually be seen in a couple of diseases that are not mediated by immune complex deposition. Um, and in humans, it's very important to discern between the ones that are not immune complex disease and the ones that are, because you treat them completely differently. Um, and even though uh, we rarely see the non-immune complex ones in veterinary medicine, they're very rare in small animals, we do see them. So, um, so that's why having the EM and having the immunofluorescence to verify that it is immune complex mediated is really important for the clinician because now they know they need to immunosuppress. Um, so again, that might be some, and that, that is addressed in the hopefully soon to be published uh, Jeb and Kennedy chapter, um, and, and um, Dr. Moore and I definitely um, address that topic of the difference between a pattern and having membranal proliferative glomerulonephritis. Um, so if you guys have questions about that, again, this, that would be uh, in the future as opposed to actually having to know it from 2014 boards. Um, so um, if you're taking boards this September, then just forget everything I just said. Um, but again, but, um, but going forward, the idea of pattern of injury having, and particular patterns of injury being recognizable, especially at the light microscopic level, having different disease entities that are their fundamental causes it is an important right. concept to get uh, ingrained into people. That, uh, that you, if calling it an MPGN pattern of injury does not mean that it's necessarily a membrane of glomerulonephritis with subendothelial right. immune complex deposits. It, 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 by so in, in, as an example, if I see something and I'm not 100% sure, it looks hypercellular, it looks like there could be a few foci that are remodeled, I will put on my interpretation, it has this pattern, but I need to wait for immunofluorescence and electron microscopy before I can make a definitive diagnosis. So I'm very upfront with the clinicians that submit the biopsy by saying, look, it has a pattern, but I need the additional studies before I can definitively call it. Um, and I think there's nothing wrong with you guys doing that, especially if you're out in practice and you're reading for IDEX and you have an impression that this is what it is. But you don't want to, you know, um, you're, you're exposing the dog to potentially very expensive and somewhat sometimes dangerous immunosuppressive therapy. So um, that's, that's kind of why you, we're trying to at least be a little more straightforward with we do know it or we don't know it. And then again, it's our impression at the um, IVRPS that it, they're more likely to be hypertensive um, than, other, than other kinds of proteinuric kidney disease. Um, this particular patient was Lyme positive. Um, she has the random history of previously eating grapes one month prior, which ends up probably not being related to why she presented again. Um, so, but you always have to, you know, take that into account that there was some history of eating grapes previously. Um, and her UPC was 4.8, but it had been around 10 one week prior to biopsy. And she had been hypertensive one week prior to biopsy. Um, so um, I think we're out of time at this point. Um, does anybody have any very specific questions about the immune complex diseases that were presented today?
Okay, he's not seeing any questions. If you have any questions you need to email me, um, that would be great. And like I said, uh, we will meet again. I think George has selected the date. I think it will be the 21st, correct, George? Uh, if that suits uh, you, uh, that would be the better one for me. Okay. So we'll send out an invitation, and like I said, we will get the conference call system working here as well so that we don't have to call from my iPhone um, in the future. But I'm glad that, I mean, thank you guys for at least volunteering and for speaking up. Um, uh, hopefully, um, any questions you guys have that you want to email me directly, I can respond to. And all of this will be available as a PDF probably by the end of the day so you guys can have access to this PowerPoint. Okay. And as before, uh, uh, we're all in the early phases of, get, of getting good at doing this, so uh, feedback about what worked, what didn't work, uh, send it to me, send it to Rachel. Uh, we're anxious to have it be uh, effective for everyone, and, uh, and letting us know uh, what, what we need to improve it is crucial. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, George. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel.